Hey everybody, this is So Many Sequels. I'm Josh. I'm Garrett. And I'm David. Welcome to the show. It's uh, the end of So Many Sweethearts Month. We got a big one today. We got a big one today because it's our audience pick, our fan pick. You guys voted for this uh, over on Instagram and threads. And we're uh, going to talk about it later. You've got mail. This is a classic We've already talked about one other classic this month. Uh, uh, well, an undisputed classic, anyway, When Harry Met Sally. The other two, mm-hmm. <laughs> maybe they'll be classics someday. Return to me. A hidden and gem, her. for sure. Hidden gem. Um, hidden gem and a non-conventional. Unconventional. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about it. It's, 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 there's a lot of, it's just a really interesting movie and for a lot of different reasons. Um, but before we do that, Let's kind of talk about what's been going on. You know, we haven't talked about what's been going on in, like, the movie world in a few minutes, I feel like. There were, we talked about the strike when it was pretty ongoing, but it's been kind of... Eh, I don't really know what's been going on since then. But things are heating up with awards season. We've had the BAFTAs. We've had the SAG Awards. Um, I think Oppenheimer won all of them everywhere. Uh, but all at once. I all think. at once. Uh, so that's interesting in the lead up to the Oscars, which is happening very soon. I think it's March 10th, uh, something like that, early March. So excited about that. I, I wasn't kidding though. Oppenheimer has been cleaning up. Do you guys think? Do you, what do we think? Is it the is it the favorite now for the for the best categories, best picture, best director, best actor? David, I, I feel like you know I don't want to say his name, but I'll say a theme song. And that uh, all the other movies, they got no chance in hell. You know, mm. they just uh, mm. they just don't. There's no chance. That's what they've got. Uh, yeah, Oppenheimer's yeah. gonna win everything. And again, that for that for me just kind of sucks some of the fun away from it. But there sure. there are some competitive races. But yeah, I right. think that most things that uh, Oppenheimer's nominated for, they're probably taking. Uh, to quote another term from the industry you're referencing, "Never say never" is what I'll say. This you know, there fair. could always be. A, you never know what the academy. Sometimes they make a weird, weird decision out of nowhere. So uh, I'll say it seems very likely. I mean, you know, if you're putting odds on it, high odds on Oppenheimer to not necessarily, I don't think sweep, but to take most of the big cat categories. But never put it past the academy to, for whatever reason, pick a movie you weren't expecting. What is this year's, you know, what is this year's, uh, I, I don't know if it was expected for like Coda to win. But like you know, or Green Book, or whatever. But like anything can happen, so we'll just uh, we'll just see. But you know, I think this year we've got a lot of great nominees for for Best Picture. So mm. I don't know if I'd be hurt with any of them. Right. But we'll talk about that probably more next week. I, I, I can't confirm it, but I highly suspect that you all may have slipped a wrestling reference past me. But um, <laughs> I'll have to check that back in editing. <laughs> Um, very possible very no, possible i was, I don't I was so. just gonna say I, I, I the reason yeah it always does kind of take the sales out of the fun when it seems like a movie is just gonna obviously win um mm-hmm. yeah also it's a, it, like that impact is lessened a little bit when i at least feel that okay it's deserved i do think sure it's deserved. No, I'm not, yeah like We're sometimes not, it'll be a movie that. that's like uh, i don't think it should be that movie but this like like you said david there's a lot of great picks here that I don't know if any of them would really upset too many people, except maybe the maestro. <laughs> um, just I feel because like, who saw that? Yeah, I feel like the problem is, like, it is kind of like, oh, the Patriots won the Super Bowl again? You mean oh, the best right. team in the history of the world the won Patriots again? The Patriots wow, and the Chiefs and the Patriots oh, and you the mean Chiefs. Oh, you're going to put, gonna put uh, one of the world's I mean, greatest directors in the book and put one of the, in, like, the most historical things in the history of the world, and he does practical effects, and so he made this big, giant thing that's really <laughs> freaking cool to watch. Like, oh, and he won the best picture? How I mean, deserving. Like, that's in, the way in, in terms of this award season, that's definitely the case. It's just been rolling and rolling and rolling. But in terms of some of the people involved, like, this will be the first awards for a lot of the people who are, like, it'll be, it would, it would, I think it would be for Robert Downey Jr.'s first Academy Award if he were to win. It would be Killian Murphy's first. Uh, it would be Christopher Nolan's first Academy Award if he were to win uh, in either of the categories he's nominated in. Um, I think the only time he's ever been nominated for an Academy Award was, I think, gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. Uh, somebody probably fact-checked me on this. I think he was nominated for Best 
screenplay for The Prestige, maybe? And he might have been nominated for something with, like visual effects or something with The Dark Knight. I mean, I he's he, not technically. I think he accepted on behalf Maybe Interstellar? Of, uh, Heath Ledger. I think he was the mm-hmm. acceptance speech on that one. But, I mean, that's not him, obviously. But I right. think I heard that was the last time he was on the Oscars stage. So, you know, this will be a this will be for the people who are involved. It'll be a, a momentous because, like, <clears throat> there's a lot of people who who've said for a long time, like Christopher Nolan's a good director, but he's not like a best picture director or a best director director. Um, he's like you got Lily Gladstone out there mm-hmm. raking up things. I think it's going to be. Uh, I think she'll win. You know, we'll I know. See. I think she's. I feel, like, I feel like that's one where Emma Stone could could surprise everybody and win too. But mm-hmm. um, I think it's up for Lily to take it and that would be great and you know we're going to be doing our own special Oscar review and recap Mm -hmm. um, just after the show or maybe the day after the show I don't know we'll we'll find out but uh, uh, as well as our own Oscar themed month coming up pretty soon right Josh yep we got a lot of Oscar stuff coming up Um, so be sure to follow us on social media for that you can find us on Facebook Instagram uh, threads TikTok all those places and those links are also at so many Um YouTube, subscribe to us on YouTube so you can watch the video version of the show. Um, and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if you can help with that. That really helps the show a lot. Um, okay, that's all the not fun stuff. Let's go ahead and get into the movie. But first, we'll talk about the box office breakdown of You've Got Mail. All right, like we said this week, it's all about You've Got Mail. This movie came out in 1998, stars the classic rom-com duo of Tom Hanks and Meg Ryan. Letterboxd describes this movie as such. Someone you pass on the street may already be the love of your life. Bookstore magnate Joe Fox and independent bookshop owner Kathleen Kelly fall in love in the anonymity of the internet, both blissfully unaware that he's trying to put her out of business. A tale as old as time, I believe mm-hmm. you've called it, David. <laughs> How did the people respond to this? Was this a big hit? We know it was. Yeah, you know, it was. It was a pretty big hit. We have to go back to December 18th of 1980, 1998. It was a Christmas flick, if you can believe it. Christmas time flick, I guess we should say. Clearly not set at Christmas, with, with all the references to, you know, New York in the spring. They do have a Christmas in the movie, though. So, anyway... You Got Mail opened in the number one spot with $18.4 million that weekend, uh, just ahead of the also debuting Prince of Egypt, which brought in fourteen point five. So actually a pretty good weekend uh, for those two uh, competitively. In the number three spot, you had uh, Pit Disney Pixar's A Bug's Life in its fifth week, bringing in 9.9. Here's a film we've reviewed before, is Star Trek Insurrection, perhaps one of the top two most boring Star Trek films there is. However, no doubt. not without some fun. Dude, that is. Huh? It was bad. You watched it, Garrett. We watched it with even, you. I know. I don't even remember which one that is. <laughs> I, uh, that's how bad it was. So what with the face stretchers? That's what I always called it as a kid. I, I, yeah, Garrett, face. I wouldn't even know what to tell you to spark your memory. It was so forgettable. <laughs> face stretchers. It's, it's, the one where, it's the one where, uh, where, where, where <laughs> Worf gets a pimple. You remember? Nothing happens. It's like just a long episode and not even a good one. <laughs> it's a really long episode. The best part, I think, in that whole movie is that they go to a part of the ship they never go to. They launch the captain's yacht. Like, there's like a little section of the ship the that's yacht. the captain's yacht that can launch out. Never once shown in the show. Never even hinted at. Anyway. Uh, and then at number five, Jack Frost, starring... Uh, Kiefer, is it Kiefer in that? It's Michael Keaton. Michael Keaton. Yeah, I knew he was a key. As a snowman. Yeah. There was a key in the name. Keegan Michael Key, maybe. Um, anyway, so 18.4 million opening weekend. The movie did great uh, during the holiday run, only dropping 1.8% in its second week, uh, and then only dropping 20% after that. Uh, the movie would go on to make $115 million in the United States, 135 overseas for a worldwide total of $250 million on a $65 million budget. It was the number 14 movie of 1998. Number one movie in 1998 was another Tom Hanks film, Saving Private Ryan. Uh, number two was Armageddon. Number three, There's Something About Mary. Number four, the aforementioned A Bug's Life. And at number five, The Waterboy with Adam Sandler. Whoa. 
<laughs> Didn't see that one coming. It, also, I feel like it's a weird world where Saving Private Ryan and You've Got Mail came out in the same year. That, right? Uh, I agree. Didn't ever. Nope. Doesn't seem right to me. Doesn't seem yeah, right I at agree. all. You know, uh, some some other, mov- other movies that came out that year, movies that we reviewed previously on that podcast include Halloween H2O and uh, The X-Files. The first X-Files Ooh. movie came out that year. Yeah. Uh, one of the first okay. movies we ever did here at So Many Sequels. You can go back and listen to Josh Garrett and Andrew's thoughts on The X-Files. A um, couple true. other movies came out that year. The Rugrats movie. Uh, Shakespeare in Love, which I think won the uh, Academy Award that year. Picture. Over yeah. Saving Private Ryan. Um, what else here? Uh, the Wedding Singer. The Wedding Singer and The Waterboy came out the same year. What do you think about? That makes more sense. And then, and then uh, Blade. I'm just going to throw out Blade also came out that year. Anyway, that's all I've got for your box office breakdown for You've Got Mail. So let's uh, get into the show. Um, I don't know about you guys. I had to just rent this movie. It's not available to stream anywhere. All right. You've Got Mail. I'm excited about this one. I was excited about this one because it was our audience pick. We put this out on on social media and everybody voted. And you know what? It was a really good vote. Um Mm-hmm. Every no, well, not every movie, but a, there was a widespread of votes across these ca- this category, and I thought we might have had to have had a runoff at one point, but you've got mail did secure the bag in the end, uh, so that's what we're talking about today because that's what uh, you all wanted us to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, Brand away just with to it. kind of start. Have we have all have we all seen this before? Was this anyone's first time watching? It was my first time watching. Uh, it was David. Mm-hmm. It was. Oh, okay. mine too. Oh, I did not know this, Garrett. I could have sworn we. Wa- I could have sworn we watched it. <laughs> no, I believe that we watched Sleepless in Seattle because I did that for another. You podcast. right? Okay, I remember watching that. Wow. I had that same. I had that same confusion. Yes. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Well, what did you guys think of it then, as a first time watch in 2024? Nick, Garrett, what did you, you think? You know, again. I, I, I see no reason, you know, I think we, we did, when Harry Met Sally and I had concerns that that was going to be like this over the top kind of cheesy start of what I feel like modern rom-coms have ev- de- devolved into over time. Mm-hmm. And I think this was like the good version and the start of that, not not when Harry Met Sally. I think that this is obviously, and, and again, for me, knowing a lot of this, um, but seeing it for the first time, I get you know where a lot of the tropes come from in modern little rom-com things um i i think that there were some really cute moments and i think that the obviously tom hanks and meg ryan are incredible uh actors and they have incredible chemistry obviously they keep doing rom-com movies together around this time i think they did like three together um and so they have that rapport where they just know how to work with each other and they're believable i had some issues with a few bits and pieces of the overall story um some pieces that maybe don't hold up over time but that doesn't necessarily uh have an issue or hold it against the movie because i don't think it's done with poor intent i think it's just the way it was in certain places and now it's just like oh it's not great so uh we'll talk about that but overall i felt like i really enjoyed most of it and and found it very charming uh and very funny and kind of a throwback to old timey rom-coms so i thought thought it was a great pick by the audience that was an incredible breakdown david can you match that? you know yeah at first i i said to myself oh man this may be more dated than when harry met sally that was what i thought at first when we start off with these like really blocky uh google map like uh uh, technology for the opening credit uh sequence and i was like is this gonna be one of those movies that just gets the internet totally wrong and just like stuff that like the internet that's not how it works or something like that and um but you know i was actually pleasantly surprised the movie was um i thought it was you know sharply written i thought that the characters were engaging you know and there was i think a good job of writing an antagonism between them uh a sort of understandable justifiable antagonism for why they wouldn't necessarily get along but at the same time it was juxtaposed with this great uh, offline online relationship where they you see exactly why they get along when they aren't concerned about what other people might think you know what i mean this personal relationship uh via letters or via email so um i was i thought that you know 
I thought that was great. I thought the characters were were fun. Tom Hanks is pretty funny in this movie at times. Um, at other times, he's wildly condescending, but I want to get into that later. Um, and then Meg Ryan, uh, you know, there's a reason Meg Ryan's sort of like uh, on probably the Mount Rushmore of uh, rom-com leading ladies. Um, I think she earned her spot with that. Um, it is kind of interesting to think about the differences between 1998 and 2024 is this conceptually even possible because of how like anonymity works on the internet today what would be the how would you do this movie today like what's the what's the uh the analog of you know anonymous chat and email i mean i guess you could probably find a way to do it but i don't know if you could string it out for as long as this couple did so yeah i thought it was pretty good i also garrett had issues with sort of like the motivation for why certain things happen um but i don't think it took away from my overall uh appreciation what about you josh okay. this is a multi-time watch for you yeah this is a favorite of mine i've loved you've got mail for a while um uh, so i've seen it several times uh and i and I, I i love it i continue to love it it's it's uh, yeah, you can see how it could be a movie that's like, oh no, is this going to be really dated now? But it's not so much because it does kind of get, uh, well, I think anyway, who, who am I but an eight-year-old in 1998? Uh, but I think it captures the spirit right and the world right and kind of mm-hmm. how people approached online relationships in those early internet chat room days. Because uh, this is, you know, one of the first times that this concept of online dating is going mainstream in a in a big movie. Um you know but what makes it still a timeless movie is that that aspect isn't the key component like the relationship works regardless of it and it's kind of still still manages to play on tropes um Mm -hmm. you know david you you mentioned the anonymity part and that's that's exactly what i wanted to talk about because of how different this the the relationship ecosystem is then versus now uh because the internet was or could be anonymous then you really can't do that anymore um it's very hard to be anonymous on the internet Mm -hmm. uh to think that someone could go through this even is like how could you not know it was him it's hard to believe Mm -hmm. but back then uh, maybe it was um so i thought that was fascinating and another thing i wanted to mention on this real quick uh, just because this is what got my brain kick started on it is you know sometimes when we watch these movies i try to find some kind of youtube clip behind the scenes or something and this time i found something even better <laughs> i found a full episode of the rosie o'donnell show from 1998 that was the you've got mail special where oh, the man. whole cast was on the show and uh they had these segments like between the segments where they would do online polls and again this is like a 1999 1998 aol poll and one of them was how would you want to meet someone online six mm-hmm. percent mm-hmm. said in an online dating club 40 some odd percent said um in a specialty chat room and mm-hmm. then the other 40 some odd percent said, I would never meet someone online <laughs> in 1998. And I was right. like, oh, these are real people back then. The movie got it right. Yeah, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. yeah. yeah because. Yeah. Well, I yeah. think there's a trope of people who don't want to admit that they met their significant other. Well, there was on back a then. dating app or whatever. But I'm saying that I still think there is now. Oh, to some extent. That's yeah. Still, it's just yeah, not I, as I think strong. It's obviously, I think that's the only way people meet people anymore most of the time but i still think there's a certain percentage of people that are like oh, there's still a stigma let's come up there with is. a different story yeah mm-hmm. well yeah and I that's think that's also yeah. riddled throughout the movie there's a lot of insecurities about uh like i really love the part towards the end where um she says to joe you know oh you're never gonna believe you'll never believe where i met him and he's like the internet <laughs> <laughs> and she's like how did you know how did you go yeah yeah and today like, would be like oh of course you met them on the internet yeah it's like but where, where uh, else would you oh the internet well yeah um I know. you know i i really appreciated that 
they went that 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 was a big part of it like it was like i loved when steve zahn's like it could be this guy the murderer that they just yeah. caught you know in the news look he was arrested last night you know like he didn't meet you uh, all that stuff i love uh i love you know the it's still a lot of insecurities you have today like when you're gonna meet someone who you haven't seen online which is like not really doesn't happen anymore now when you meet somebody online like that's their profile is right in your face you see their photo and you're just hoping that they're what they're representing but um yeah back then the aol the chat rooms you know everything was hidden behind you know names and there was no there was no photos take forever to download a photo back then yeah the the early the way this hit early was pretty nostalgic Mm -hmm. uh, for for the the dial-up modem and then you got the you've got the you got mail mm-hmm. yeah. right out the gate and i was honestly you've really happy mail. that didn't revisit that over and over i was right. i was honestly a little concerned that every time they got mail you were going to hear it because mm-hmm. of how the time was and that that was really wonderful to to hear it that very opening segment and then not hear it again until like later or something whenever you're exp- there was a moment specifically i think where they didn't have mail and i was expecting to hear it and i didn't hear it and i was like oh and i heard a little bit made the voice a little character and i appreciated that they didn't overuse that annoying sound yeah, yeah. you know something if i can that i want to talk about that i really liked about this movie was you know this has been a long time. This has been a problem with films for a long time, and that's how to display or how to how to communicate text on screen. And there's been tons of ways to do it over time. You know, like if you're looking at a letter, sometimes you'll see the text then like written out, or the people will read it in their head. I thought this did a great combination of showing you what they're typing, but also using that internal monologue of of Tom Hanks of Meg Ryan mm-hmm. to articulate what they're writing as they're doing it, and it gives you. I think a better window into who they are than if you were just watching them type or if it was purely in their head. Like I thought that they did a great job of blending the two things. Um, because you know, like even today when someone brings out a cell phone uh, in a movie and you're having to like look at text on a cell phone, it's always like an awkward, like I'm just looking at a phone. I don't like that, (laughs) you know? So like, I love when movies can find interesting ways to display text messaging or email or, or whatever it is. Um, and I thought that this had that struggle early on and I thought they did a good job of blending it with their internal monologue. Occasionally when Tom is talking or Meg are talking, they'll be like typing and then they'll just say, uh, stupid to die or whatever. Like they just like do little, you know, out loud murmurs of what they're saying along with their narration. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to talk about the performances uh, a little bit now. Uh, I want to start, too, with Tom Hanks, because he does play a really interesting character in this, where, uh, David, I believe you said he is very funny, but then also very condescending. And I Hmm. agree with you. There was a point in, in, I wrote down, I took some notes during this one, uh, what a pompous ass, LOL, (laughs) is what I wrote. Uh, And I don't even remember what what scene I wrote that at, but it, it applies to many of them. He's so unlikable sometimes as Joe. And I like that because I think he has to be for the audience. Because you don't want to like Joe as much as you like NY152 until mm-hmm. um, Shop Girl does, right? At least that's how I think it works. Uh, so he, but he does a really good job of balancing that where you don't hate him too much or he wins you back. Yeah, I think he, he yeah. yeah, go ahead, Garrett. Go ahead. I was just going to say very, uh, you know, dickish yeah. <laughs> uh, in the realms of <clears throat> Tom Hanks characters. Um, I really, God, there was that boardroom scene. All those men and all the men in this movie, except for like Steve Zahn sucked. I mean, they were just <laughs> yeah. awful, awful. But like, duh, why not? <laughs> That's accurate. So I kind of appreciated that. It was fun to see the dad from christmas vacation being like an old man boardroom because i just imagine that person is still alive running most of the boardrooms so you know it seemed pretty accurate definitely you know and i um there's specifically the the scene that stood out to me and i'm gonna hit two things here at once with tom hanks's character and being really being kind of like very condescending is the scene in the grocery store where Mm -hmm. meg's Meg Ryan's character, uh, Kathleen, has stumbled mm-hmm. into the cash-only line, or and she has only a credit card. 
and like she's like very patiently very kindly trying to say like i'm sorry i i'm in the wrong line can you just make a se- exception and tom hanks comes up and i'm baffled by this tom hanks comes up and is the most condescending person to this grocery store worker that i've ever seen like he's like hi uh, what's your name rose is it that's a very he's that's so a very froze. beautiful name yeah. he's right, so and this guy goes froze. and then he goes and i'm henry he goes nice to meet you henry and he goes rose this is a this is a credit card machine right sorry you gotta run this card for us please rose happy thanksgiving by the way this is where you say happy thanksgiving back and she goes happy thanksgiving back and he goes so are you gonna do it and she's like okay and i'm like what what i mean am i just like am i just out of my mind in terms of watching this scene because like that would not fly in the new york that i know i she tell him to go f himself i was so confused yeah, that, that scene made zero sense and i also <laughs> made note that i hated that scene and thought it was stupid and the fact that everybody hated her after she like apologized or whatever and was just trying to live her day and everybody loved this condescending ass face that came over and like put on a fake smile oh i hate it i love that the whole be- the whole line behind her turned against her it's like it did and and I, like, I looked at the i watched what does she think she is i looked up this specific scene on youtube after the movie and all the comments are like this is my favorite scene oh my gosh this is so funny i love this so much and i'm like what am i watching am i watching the same scene as everyone else but um, I, I, I think it explicitly is a scene written for a visa product placement. Like mm-hmm. there's product placement all through this movie with the Starbucks, obviously AOL, the visa cards, and uh, oh, there's got to be something else that I'm leaving off. But I feel like it's written for that because he like broadly flashes a visa card right, in, you know, right at the camera. Uh, it just kind of feels like that's what it's for. I don't know. What do you guys think? Oh, yeah, I, I think the product placement was intentional, especially with AOL and um, Visa. <laughs> that seemed pretty overt. Um, but anyway, getting back to Tom Hanks, I think that, like, he does a very fun balance because he's great with he's great with his aunt and his, aunt and his brother, and he's um, he, is, he is kind of a ruthless businessman. But at the same time, he has, like, he kind of, like, resents himself for it at times. That's the other side of his life is sort of, wishing that like he or, you know he's more sensitive than the person he has to be in his everyday life nah, i have issues with that but we'll get there in a yeah <laughs> all right what about what about meg ryan she plays a completely different type in this she is she is p- pretty consistent uh, whereas joe kind of plays a two-faced to a degree not always mm-hmm. intentional um but she is kind of like literally the, the the shop girl next door um which is Meg Ryan's bread and butter at the time, I feel like. Mm-hmm. Um, what are what are any notes on her? Perfect. I thought she was. I thought she was really <laughs> no, nice in this. She's, I know. Uh, you she know. I mean, I, I appreciated. No, I think this, yeah. I think she, uh, she's so. No, ahead, or she romanticizes him, uh, him so much, and I and I appreciate that because it feels very realistic to what people uh, do with an anonymous. Uh, kind of person or an online figure um of course she's going to build him up into the perfect person and want it to all work out and she just plays so well off of his slightly more cynical approach like it's interesting because because he's not fully cynical toward it but but he still offers a contra- contrast so i don't know i thought she was i thought she is perfect in that role yeah agreed um, Agreed, their, you know, I think favorite, she's really nice. One of my favorite interactions they have, uh, and again, where Tom Hanks really shows that he's an asshole, is when he just scoops up all the caviar from that from that table, that plate on the table, and she, just because he wanted to. Like, he did it to make her mad. <laughs> and I was like, you're a jerk. You are an actual jerk. Because that's actually not for you. <laughs> He is. I don't like the uh, the businessman version of Tom Hanks, yeah. and uh, my issues <clears throat> with the overall story come from he knowingly like he finds out the he he learns the whole story early, like before right. she pieces all of the evidence together, and despite knowing, he still is on a Shark Tank mission to ruin her life. I know. 
and take everything from her with no care mm-hmm. in the world, despite the fact that he knows that he's in love with that woman. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's not personal. And he's still like, yeah, but I'm going to ruin you <laughs> and the legacy your mom left, and I'm going to step on its neck and choke it and rip it out page by page. And, 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 he's and then like, he has the audacity at the end to be like, you're going to, you have the ability to forgive a person for standing you I sure you wish up, you would. But you can't forgive me for putting you out of business, despite you're, the fact that you're also the dude that You're both guys. Like, what are you doing? You're both guys. It you was very have confusing. No winning argument whatsoever, Joe. None. I do. I want to come back around to Meg Ryan again, but at the same time, yeah. yes, Garrett, you're hitting my exact thing of like I. I feel like he, he. What he does by the end, by the time he learns, he what he does is like deceptive, and I feel like it shouldn't be romantic, but apparently it is to every woman I've ever met who loves this movie so much. And, and and the men who love this movie, it feels like it feels like he's like totally manipulating her by being both her best friend and confidant, and her best friend and new confidant. Where like he's talking about the conversations he's having with her, he's feeding lines to himself to make himself seem better or whatever. Like it seems so weird to me. I see what you're saying. There were no situation. In that in that ninety eight mindset, I can see how you would think like, oh, that is a grand romantic gesture. But in a twenty twenty four mindset, I think, oh, that is predatory behavior and shows a clear pattern. <laughs> <laughs> That's like I've seen I it's, I've seen investigation well, discovery. I know where this goes. Um, and, and like you but said, that didn't exist com- back then. <laughs> like you said, though, it's compounded with the idea that like he's he's running her out There's of business, like and then he of realizes. On MTV. And then he realizes that he's he's running her out of business, right? Like, and he makes no effort to be like, mm, the woman I love turns out I'm ruining her life. Should I stop? <laughs> no. No thoughts. He's just, no. Uh, it's, he that goes, no, I should. <laughs> no. No, I'll just, I'll just. It's the principal Skinner both. meme. No, it's the children just, who are wrong. <laughs> no, I'll just play both sides of her love life against each other and then she'll be somehow some she says i was hoping it was you were you yeah i don't know so when were you gonna say that but at the same time because real life version of him for her insufferable i I mean i understand until until the turn i turned eventually but like he could have when he went there knowingly to stand her up and and be late he could have been like hey i know that we've had our differences but also this is me. Yeah. And, you know, you could have had that I know. I keep thinking by the end, he has made both versions of him into an asshole. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> why did you sabotage both versions of you? <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, but then she loved him anyway, my wife, which is great. This, I, this only works in the movies, and that's why it's fine. My wife loves this movie, and I appreciate her. Oh, yeah, her, 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 her You know, her, her argument for it was he wanted to... He felt like he needed to earn her trust enough for her to believe that he was actually the guy on the other side of these letters, or the other side of these emails. And I get that. Like, he had to, like, he had to undo all of the awful that he was in person to her. But still, I, I feel like he could have just, at some points, just, he could have just come out and said, by the way, I'm the guy you've been communicating with. I realize oh, I, I need to earn your trust back. I don't know. Right. It, anyway. I know. I, I was told the same thing by my partner. So like, it's it's the I, I respect the argument, and it sounds like we're hating on this movie. And I'm trying. I want to make. I'm just confused. That I found it very charming and fun. Yeah, I just have <laughs> questions about the story. I just have questions about the story. I just don't feel like it would work if I tried it. That's what it comes back to, right? That it's like, but this isn't real life, and we all know that, right? 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 You yes, right. like, yes, but yes, yes, yes. sometimes the journey is perfectly fine. Yes, right. Because um, I'm like, yeah, clearly this would never work in real life, at least not in today's world. Again, it's just no, but too, I, we we know too much now. But also, I think it's like so. Uh, I kind of I think I got jittery earlier when I was trying to talk about Meg Ryan, but I thought she was so. She seemed so smart in this movie. Like she seemed like she couldn't. She she couldn't bring herself to be bold enough to stand up for herself. And when she finally got that ability, it was like uh, the other half of her character really unlocked. And she was now sort of who she always was supposed to be. Like she was she was kind and she was sweet and she was smart. But now she's, you know, she's assertive and 
she's strong and if if she had wanted to she could have told tom hanks to screw off at the end of this movie and everybody would have been like yeah you tell him or whatever you know it could have gone either way but uh, i also loved i mean it was what she needed in order to have this great mutual breakup with greg kinnear um <laughs> which was one of my more favorite scenes of the movie too was uh, the mutual breakup with greg kinnear who was like super luddite boyfriend afraid of technology was like his first his opening thing is hey hun do you see they had to get rid of solitaire on military bases because the <laughs> men were just wasting so much time on the game it's the end of western society i'm telling you and i'm that <laughs> just rolled my eyes thinking solitaire he sucks <laughs> i i uh i want to get back to meg ryan but can we can we can we veer off into the side characters because i love really to they were really crazy uh, I like I loved Greg Kinnear. Mm-hmm. I thought he was so much fun. I always love Greg Kinnear when he shows up as a as a side character. Such a good character. Actor. His he obsession with himself time. is incredible. Yes. Yes. It was so so silly, and I loved it. The breakup scene was weird and funny, but like I got I got, whatever. I don't care. <clears throat> I don't love you. And then uh, Parker Posey. Yes. Parker Posey uh, is um, Joe's significant other. Uh, I think there was a line that was. Uh, she makes coffee nervous and mm-hmm. that was a good way to describe her and i thought she was crazy but i didn't like that she just kind of disappeared i felt yeah. like this is a classic it. movie where the, all the second char- all the secondary characters just disappear like dave Chappelle, when he sees that meg ryan like the, the catholic i think i think that's his i could be wrong i think that's his last scene when he sees that kathleen kelly is actually shop girl he's like you don't like that kathleen kelly chick no I don't think you're gonna like yeah, her, Dave right? Dave Chappelle disappears that's overnight. Scene. It's like, He's and that's the same with the movie. That's the same with almost everybody. Like everybody just up and gone. By like by the time that they start having their their relationship, she has no other friends. Like Steve Zahn disappears, uh, Dabney Coleman disappears. Yeah, everybody just gone. So it's very yeah. uh, that happens sometimes with like with with movies like this, but I don't, know, I don't think it necessarily detracts. It was just kind of funny that like that all of a sudden gone everybody's everybody's disappeared yeah uh going back to meg ryan just real quick i really i really enjoyed the scene where she laid into joe Mm -hmm. um and and was just like you know i wrote down um my note is uh she's pretty mean to him to be honest with you but when she called him a suit he needed to hear it he is gleefully trying to ruin people's lives not cool and that's like i I felt like she, she did go too far but i think that you know again david you mentioned that she found that regret and so she was able to find that that line of being able to be assertive but sometimes you have to cross that line in order to find it so Mm -hmm. i really appreciated that scene because throughout the movie she is so um you know you i think that it would be almost mean to call it a stereotype but like you know ditzy and and nice and sweet and kind of people might see her as gullible Mm -hmm. but she's just a nice person who is caring about her community and trying to deliver something in a caring person and so she doesn't want to be mean she has no need to be mean um she wants to give people the benefit of the doubt until she just meets somebody who just pushes every single button in a way that she can't handle it and um feels that regret and guilt because she's a nice person so exactly uh, i really just thought that was a well-acted scene incidentally the, the movie did make me think of uh the banshees of anna sharon where she was like she was like my mother was nice and people remember her and then she made me think of, i think of the baby like, my mother was nice yeah and, you know and, and Brenda gleason's like who cares <laughs> you know she didn't make music or whatever um no but yeah and, and then i love uh sort of how much she, her character cares about this sort of stuff I, the funny thing is, is like joe he doesn't know it yet, but in about 10 to 15 years, the internet that he loves so much is going to drive his own companies out of business. Because, <laughs> like, current day big bookstores, like, you know, are struggling to keep their own building, big buildings open because online is just taking so much of the business away from even the, the, the regular brick and mortar bookstores. Or, I mean, the, the big brick and mortar bookstores. Tonight at six, Amazon is killing your local Barnes and Noble. Oh, exactly, exactly. Now you know. So and and even I mean, even those stores own online systems. Are like you know, like you go to the store and they'll tell you like, yeah, you probably just need to get it online. We don't have it here in the store. So uh, interesting. I was I was laughing about. It was kind of it was kind of ironic to watch from the twenty twenty mindset that part of the story of 
this big box chain is running the little store out of business when well, now those big box chains are struggling to stay in business. So. Yeah. Um. Ugh, I don't even know where to transition from that. I was going to say, do you want to talk about Josh? I, like, I know you noted that you were like that Godfather <laughs> sequence. Yeah, it just seemed like I, I didn't know how to bring that up then. <laughs> uh, um, well, yeah. So. Yeah, I, I don't really have much else to say. So we can transition to whichever way. Yeah, well, I've got a little. I got So it's something we talked about last week. I got a little breakout I want to talk about. Something we talked about off mic last week. And that is the co-star age gaps Josh do you want to uh, make a note to cu- uh, cut some of that out yeah okay well we are we're at like the 28 minute mark in this one or something 29 yeah okay. roughly 29 minute mark yeah, well, and before you start, I was just going to say, yeah, I just didn't want to go from Meg Ryan to, well, back to Tom Hanks, so <laughs> yeah, it yeah. felt like unnatural, so I just won't bring it up. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, you know, the best part of that for me was was when she asked Greg Kinnear, like, you know what it means to go to the mattress? And he goes, yeah, the Godfather. And she's like, oh, yeah. that, that to me is the, that's the, that's the great follow-up on that, on that line. Okay, here we go. Hang on. <clears throat> Here's something that I wanted to talk about. Uh, and this is something we kind of talked about a little bit off mic last week, but that's something that this is a conversation that comes up a lot in Hollywood movies, but specifically with rom-coms, and that's the age gap between co-stars. And we've done, uh, this is our, uh, what, fifth film now? Fourth fourth film of the month. And I just want to read you some, some stats here about the age gaps between the co-stars and the movies we've watched. So going back to Return to Me, David Duchovny was 39, Minnie Driver was 29. In her, Joaquin Phoenix was 39, Scarlett Johansson was 29. In When Harry Met Sally, Billy Crystal was 40 years old when that movie was made, and Meg Ryan was 27. Now, this wow. movie has the best uh, has the best gap. Meg Ryan was 37 when this movie came out, and Tom Hanks was 42. Hey. So, we, interestingly, it's only a five year gap there instead of what uh, 13 between Billy Crystal and. 10 in the other cases but uh, it's still interesting that meg ryan is a leading lady in this at 37 which is still younger than all the men have been in each and every one of these um yeah and that's i don't really know exactly where i want to go with that but what is how do you guys feel about the conversation of these age gaps when it's so it's 10 plus years in some of these cases i think the strangest thing and women. that you didn't even mention and i and i see why not but uh parker posey is 29 in this movie and she plays yeah. tom's girlfriend yeah so you know talk about an even more significant age gap uh, yeah well, uh, i wonder what greg kinnear was hang on i can look I'm that sure up he's probably close to uh meg ryan's age i would guess he's but, probably between 35 and 40 i'd imagine yeah uh so it's definitely strange i mean there's always been a weird weird age things with casting uh, particularly when it comes to men versus women, because pretty much like you implied, David, um, women are considered old, were considered older <laughs> on screen, um, a lot younger than they should be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like, exactly right. Like, 37 for a leading lady in 1998 is like, whoa, okay. Like, yeah, I'm stunned. Yeah, like, this is almost like a, this is a movie for, for the middle aged. Uh, as far as uh, as far as Hollywood's concerned, when you have a, a leading lady that's 37, like all the other films we examine, and we can go down countless rom coms of the 90s, 2000s, and 2010s, and you know, under 30, that's the goal. Preferably, I guess, between 25 and 30 for most of them. But it's just kind of crazy how Hollywood. It's been enough time; they're aware of this, and they just still do it. I don't know if like I don't know what it is. That tells them, oh, if a woman's over thirty, like the movie's not going to sell because clearly it will. Like this movie sold well. I don't, I don't know. Interesting, baffling. Yeah, can't explain. Yeah, there's no reason for it other than men rule Hollywood, middle-aged <laughs> older men rule Hollywood, and they fantasize about younger women. Yep. I mean, I feel like that's probably most of it. Yep. Pretty it's true. And if this film hadn't been directed by a woman, nor Efron, right. this yes. may not, not have happened. Not you also every, right. Not every single scenario. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah. 
let's go ahead and wrap up this discussion with let's go around and share our final thoughts on the movie and uh then we'll move on into the letterbox game here um i'll start being that this was a repeat viewing for me i my opinion on it hasn't changed i love it uh yes there are some things to nitpick on but that's part of what makes movie watching fun to me uh it's fun to pick on how mean tom hanks is sometimes how unnecessarily mean sometimes and to pick on some story aspects all that to say uh it's still it's gonna it's a five-star movie for me i just can't i can't i can't what hey i enjoy it i have a five-star experience every time well i'm a little shocked that's that's all that matters um for me you're probably a little wrong I thought this movie was overall very good. I, I, I have to admit, I don't really understand some of Joe's uh, motives uh, towards the end. Um, but but overall, like I was never bored. It was very interesting. I thought the movie handled itself very well. Um, I would watch this again, so I'll give it four stars. Wow. Man. I'm surprised. <laughs> I Y'all are going to... I don't know. I feel weird about this because, again, as much as I may have picked apart some of the story it was all in good fun mm. it was not me sitting here being like oh i didn't like it <laughs> why no it was in good fun and good in jest because what they delivered was an enjoyable movie and a good time um good people delivering good performances in a fun little rom-com romp and i very much enjoyed it <clears throat> having said that because this was a first time watch for me it didn't necessarily have that same kind of you know nostalgic feel or, or had, didn't have that same kind of a connection and so uh, I also found it to be uh, very good which on my scale is a three and a half and hey, there's nothing hey, wrong hey. with that it is a very strong nothing three and a half most mo- in my opinion most, most movies are three and a half nothing wrong with a three and a half uh, see for me most movies are two and a half so <laughs> that's that's okay. a, that's that's too much hey, beyond the pale <laughs> everybody's got their own system that's what matters uh, okay, well that's our reviews. Let's uh, let's get into our letterbox game here. In the letterbox game, we take a look at some of the most popular reviews of the movie of the week on Letterboxd, our favorite movie-based social media app. And mm-hmm. uh, we we read a few reviews, we think about it, and we take a guess at what we think the average score of the movie is. Uh, so we're gonna start with david this week right you're gonna make the first guess because somehow our two-time reigning champion is losing uh, <laughs> as of behind. february but uh, is losing. <laughs> well do you want to read some Currently. popular reviews first yes yes i do yes yes um so to get things started <laughs> three stars Tom Hanks trying to convince Meg Ryan that the Godfather is the most important element of pop culture via instant messaging is every dating app interaction with men I have ever had. <laughs> uh, five stars. Roman Empire, they say. Five mm-hmm. stars. The movie equivalent of a large cup of tea. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, five I stars. Can't. The scene where Meg Ryan and Greg Kinnear tell each other they aren't in love and then start gabbing is one of the best rom-com moments of all time. <laughs> Yeah. That felt so much better for them. Oh my gosh. And then finally, three and a half stars. Well damn, I wish I had mail. <laughs> <laughs> You've got mail. I wish I could do the voice. Yeah. Um right. I mean so it's a think, classic. Dan? What's your guess gonna be? It's a classic by many people's standards. You know, a lot of people, uh, uh-huh. the debate comes down between this and Sleepless in Seattle for Nora Ephron slash mm. uh, Meg Ryan and Tom Hanks. Um, yep. Some they were some also, I say. think, both in Joe's Volcano. Um, mm. mm-hmm. They were. I'm going to say it 3.9. Oh. That's Damn. a big number. It is a big number. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. It's right in the middle of the show. It's the big number. Oh. Who goes next? Is it me? Oh, or it's Garrett. It Josh? Garrett's oh, no. next. Oh, okay. Okay. See, I don't think it's... I mean, that's a I big number. That's I am number. not that optimistic, just because our range is pretty big here. Josh gave it a five. David yeah. gave it a four. I was at three and a half, so I think it's going to be high, but I don't know. I'm gonna, I was at a three point... I, my guess was like a three point uh, six, so I think I'm going to do that. Oof. Oof, you guys have screwed me, I think. Um, <laughs> mm. 
He screwed me again, Fanny Pecker. Because <laughs> I don't want to go up. I don't even think I want to go up into four. Mm. Uh, uh, <laughs> mm, I'm going to go. I know. I'm going to go with. Um, oh. Clock's ticking. I'm going to go with four point. I'm going to go with four point oh. I, Ooh, I, 4.0. I know. I know. I'm going to go with 4.0. I forced him up the there. House. You did. You forced it. Okay, let's see. Who is going to be the winner? The, oh, my God. I. <laughs> we don't have a direct hit, but we're very oh, close. No. Uh, the winner this week is Garrett, because it is a 3.5. And that oh, was wow. my better instinct, and I went against it. <laughs> wow. wow. I'm actually shocked. I'm actually yeah, shocked. Yeah. It is a, and, well, you, you said. You feel like, you, you or you said, David, you felt like this is a perfect 3.5 movie, and you got it. Well, I said most movies are a 3.5. That's, well, that's, fair. That's okay. how I think. Uh, you know, I think that, like, you know, in the large average of things, most movies are pretty good. But uh, I am shocked because I honestly thought this was going to be up there close to uh, 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 up there close to When Harry Met Sally, which we did last week, and that was like a 4.0. Um, wow. Okay. So another win for Garrett, um, which puts him at him at three. He had a direct hit the other week, and now he's got just one. So Josh and Garrett are tied at three. I'm still scoreless. Oh. Uh, got to pick up. Got to pick up during the Oscar season here. Try yeah, harder. You're going to have to do that. Yeah, we're okay. There, this will be fun. Well, you mentioned it, David. It is Oscar season heating up, and that is why we're gonna announce that our next month's theme is Oscars. We talked about that at the top of the show for a little bit, mm-hmm. uh, but just to get you ready for it, we're doing Best Picture Month. Uh, every movie we're doing has one Best Picture, I believe, right? Yeah, they all mm-hmm. won. Yep. Um, and then, of course, we will. No, we will have a, a an Oscar show. Um, also during the month. I couldn't remember if we were doing a, a fan vote or not, but I think we decided not to. Yeah, I think no. no. I think uh, plus, when we got when you tack in the Oscar awards show, we've got it all covered. Exactly, exactly. So we're have you a got a reveal show coming up. Uh huh. Mm-hmm. We we've already uh, recorded our reveal show, so very excited to share that with you, where we will be revealing our picks to you for the month. And let me just tell you a little teaser. It's, it's kind of all over the place. Um, uh, very excited. In places you wouldn't month. expect. Yeah. I think. Uh, I think we, we did a good job. We went out there. I'm very proud of us, and I'm honest most of the time, and usually I think we fail. Yeah. And, hey, <laughs> yeah. Uh, we cover a pretty good range of we do. time, years. Yeah, we, we cover a good range of time. We cover a good range of, uh, uh, of uh, type film. Like, it's mm-hmm. it's going to be something. You just, mm-hmm. you, just, you just sign up now at so many sequels dot com or uh, wherever you listen to podcasts or on YouTube. Uh, just search for so many sequels there in your YouTube app. Uh, we're trying to get up to 121 subscribers is our new goal for YouTube. So mm-hmm. go there, hit that subscribe button. Um, and of course, if you listen to the show in the podcast version, leave us a review on Apple Podcasts if that's the app you use. Uh, that kind of helps us out a lot. You know, this is an independent organization. It is. Um, we are not ad supported um, or supported really at all <laughs> only only emotionally and that doesn't yeah. keep the lights on <laughs> no yeah um, you can rest assured you can rest assured that any any, any if you go to the patreon you choose this word none of it goes really into our pockets it all goes into just keeping the the services that we use for this program this, this podcast basically in service. yeah so leaving us reviews and stuff like that is a free way to help us mm-hmm. uh, a mm-hmm. lot because the more reviews we get, the more we get shown to people, and mm-hmm. you know, word of mouth matters. So again, do all that stuff. Uh, you can find links to our social channels at so many sequels.com as well as all of our past episodes. Uh, we'll see you guys next time uh, when we begin Oscars month. Bye. <laughs>